that I was a banker for a long time, 25 years. And um, all the time I was a banker, I got to know quite a lot about what was happening in private wealth, but I was doing remarkably little for myself. So I was time constrained, compliance constrained. So it wasn't actually until I'd retired from Goldman, suddenly I was sitting at home, had some time on my hands. No excuse. What are you doing with your own money? And by then I had a very good idea of what the market looked like. And and I was just very disillusioned because from everything I had seen, there was a, a, a good sort of traditional service out there, but nobody had fully embraced technology. Nobody had really started to think about how to weave technology into wealth management. And, and that was fascinating to me because more generally in finance, whether you're talking about insurance or foreign exchange or money management, there are many, many examples of how technology has started to, to dominate and be a critical factor. And what is the three-pot <clears throat> theory? Ah, well, so this is where... Sounds like a novel. Uh, I um, I like talking about the three-pot theory. because John I think <laughs> I think for lots of people, for most people, wealth management is right at the bottom of the priority list. And when you yes. talk about discretionary wealth management, it's like, well, what's that got to do with me? And so the three-pot theory is this. You, we all live with three pots. doesn't matter how many, how much money you have. Pot one is your liquid pot. Yeah. So you have money coming in, you've got your salary, you might have dividends, you might have a rental income. And out of that pot goes all the things you talk about, people spending money in restaurants, at the cinema, at the theatre and so on. So that's like your current account. At the other end of the spectrum is the illiquid pot, pot three. Now, in Britain... That starts with your house. Yeah, absolutely. So there you are. You've got your house. Maybe you've now got a rental portfolio. You've got some buy-to-lets. Um, maybe there's other things you have. So if you work for a bank like I did, you get paid in single stock. So you might have some single stock in there. You might have private equity. You might have fine wine, classic cars. So sometimes I call it the passion pot. Mm. But pot three, it has very different characteristics. It's less liquid. Mm. It's higher risk. Mm -hmm. And it's long term. So where discretionary wealth management fits in, is pot two. This is where you want a group of people, professional people, managing your money on your behalf. Most people don't want to do this themselves, mm. where they invest over a medium to long term period in a series of different asset classes, usually equities, fixed income, maybe commodities, and they're doing it thinking about different risk profiles. And this is where you hand <coughs> it over, as it were, to net wealth. Yeah, you hand it over to us and you, for that, the, the key about pot two is to make it low cost, I was about to say, presumably flexible. the use of tech makes it low cost. Correct. And, and it's hugely important. Mm. 